Well, uh, uh, the afternoon workshop is going to be on probability or not, um, basically discussing different methods of uh, handling uncertainty. Um, <clears throat> we're going to start off uh, <clears throat> mentioning the schedule. We're going to start off uh, with Stephen Schalkard. Is that a correct pronunciation? Stephen? Is that? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and a little bit more about him in a bit. Um, and then a, a couple of papers. Uh, first, uh, Salam Ben Farhat and Sergey. I, that's one I probably will screw up. Um, Rodionov? Rodionov. Uh, we'll follow that just, just like kind of the same um, format as usual in our AGI uh, conferences with panel, panel discussion. And then we'll have about a 30-minute break, and then um, <clears throat> the app, then we'll come back for the second part, which will be a little bit different. Um, we'll, starting off with Marcus Hooter, Ben, and then followed by Ben Gertzel and Pei, Pei Wang. Um, yeah, maybe just a word uh, on the purpose of the workshop. Uh, as most of the researchers here uh, agree that there must be some kind of uncertainty handling in the AGI systems, uh, it seems that most of them do not necessarily agree on the way to do that. Mm, many like the probability theory approach, but there are some other possibilities, if you uh, intend them, uh, like the possibility theory, fuzzy sets, and things like that. And uh, Stephen will talk about uh, such of those other possibilities, and we'll argue uh, various things why probability theory may not be the best choice. Well, I will let you judge of uh, the arguments. And uh, if you want to introduce, then Stephen and can go on on the lectures. Okay, if I okay. Um, so um, Stephen comes to us from Cardiff University in Wales, right? And um, mm. He's done a lot of work on um, possibility theory. Uh, in particular, I think it's about information web retrieval. Um, information retrieval from the web. And um, he's, going to make, he's going to argue uh, for basically more qualitative approaches, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, um, for handling uncertainty for, in the context of AGI. Good afternoon. Um, so my background is not really AGI, but I hope that the topic of this talk will at least be um, close enough. Um, let me maybe illustrate with an example um, what I'm aiming for. Um, if you ask a question to Google, like, who directed Titanic? These days it's clever enough to give us a precise answer. So it will tell us it's James Cameron, so as you can see there, it will give us a picture, it will give some, some facts about him, and so all is uh, very well. If you try to ask more complex questions to Google, it will just revert back to standard document retrieval. If you ask, um, how will the increasing wolf population in Europe affect existing ecosystems? Admittedly, not the easiest question. Um, it does a good job of, of, of offering us relevant documents, but it will not attempt to give us a meaningful answer. Um, there's things like uh, Wolfram Alpha, which is a, a more or less state-of-the-art question answering system, um, which admits to us that it doesn't understand the query. However, it did find the phrase population in Europe, and it knows about population in Europe, so it tells us some facts like this five, uh, 599 million people in Europe, and so on and so on. So completely irrelevant information. Ideally, what we would like to have, what I would like to see, is a search engine that could give us arguments like this. It could tell us that um, the increased number of predators, such as wolves, 
would probably lead to a reduced number of herbivores, like deer, and that, that will lead to more tree growth. So in fact, um, more wolves would lead to more birds and more herbivores like rodents, so the smaller herbivores. Second argument uses an analogy. Um, when they reintroduced wolves in Yellowstone, they noted that uh, that benefited scavengers because they could feed on the wolf kills. So likewise, if the wolf population in Europe increases, we can expect that that would uh, benefit scavengers which appear in Europe, like buzzards, raccoon dogs, and others. Um, third argument, uh, increased numbers of wolves will lead to more protests from farmers, will lead to more government action, uh, so in the end, not much will change. Okay, so there's, there's three different arguments. You may um, agree or disagree with them, uh, but I hope you will at least agree that uh, current technology, Google and so on, uh, cannot come close to, to providing us with, with um, arguments like this. And there's two, two problems. The first is how do we get relevant knowledge bases to, to reason about, I mean, to, to, to give us um, yeah, the knowledge bases from which to derive these arguments. And the second is what kind of logic, what kind of inference do we need to actually produce these kind of arguments. Now, if we... Okay. If, if we take a step back and if you look at what is actually available today, now we see a lot of data. Okay? There's linked data, uh, DBpedia, Freebase, open government data, and so there's increasingly more data, uh, structured data available. In some domains, uh, there's formal ontologies that can be used for reasoning. And also increasingly, uh, there's been successful uh, attempts to extract structured information from natural language, like the NEL system from Carnegie Mellon and the um, OpenIE system from uh, University of Washington. So these are facts. And so systems like Google can use these facts to answer questions like, who directed Titanic? What we're also beginning to see are systems that can learn probabilistic theories from these facts using some form of induction. Um, so there's a, a nice approach by uh, Schoenmakers from the University of Washington, which learns uh, Markov logic theory from facts extracted from natural language. Um, Nell uses weighted random walks. Uh, other people use association rule mining. So th there's different approaches, but the end products are typically rules, um, and where every rule has a certain probability attached to it. Okay, and these rules can be used to improve the accuracy of information extraction systems, or in fact, they could be just seen as um, the main theories. Now, I would argue that this is, this is very useful, but to produce the kind of arguments, like I showed about the wolves, we will probably need to extract uh, robust, reliable, symbolic domain theories from these let's say, noisy, heuristic, uh, probabilistic theories. And there's a number of reasons why I think the probabilistic domain theories, in this case, would not be enough. The first argument I would give is that the certainty base, the probabilities, have been trained from very noisy data, often from uh, positive examples alone. So they will be heuristic values, they will not be precise probabilities. So pretending that we have precise probabilities is very optimistic, and maybe it makes more sense in certain applications to consider these as order of magnitudes of probability, so we, we have some idea of, of how likely each of these facts are, but maybe stand back from um, pretending that we have accurate uh, probability degrees. Information extraction systems typically have structural errors, and that's why uh, systems like NEL have manual feedback. Okay? Um, and it seems clear that uh, however clever information extraction systems become, we will need always some form of manual feedback. Now, if we're extracting facts, that's quite easy. You can just ask people, uh, do you think this fact is right or wrong? And that's easy enough. If you want to get feedback on domain theories, then maybe it's a bit more tricky. We, we can't really show people um, a Bayesian network can say, do you think this is a meaningful representation of this domain? Uh, so it seems more likely that if we can convert a probabilistic domain theory to a symbolic theory, that we have something that we can show to people in some form of controlled natural language, say, and that people can, can read and say, okay, this makes sense or this does not make sense. Um, the other way around, if the system provides an argument, probably, at least in the beginning, people will want to see a justification or, or uh, 
uh, an explanation why the system believes that this is the correct argument. Again, providing intuitive explanations that, that end users can understand is probably going to be easier if you have a symbolic domain theory than if you start from, say, uh, a Markov network or a, a Bayesian network. Probability degrees are context dependent. Uh, I think this is clear. And uh, the last point, which I, I'm going to emphasize a bit more in the remainder of the talk, is that when we're dealing with noisy information from the web, with human defined information, um, we, we need to deal with things like uh, information which is missing, which is vague, which is inconsistent, and so on. And typically, if you want to address this in a natural way, we will need some form of similarity based reasoning. So we'll have add to, we will have to add some form of similarity to probabilistic models. And while this can be done in practice, in theory, this would, would make the, the models even more complex and would make it even harder to learn accurate degrees from uh, data. Now, let me get a bit uh, in more detail about similarity-based reasoning and, and why we need similarity in, in, in practice. Um, first example is about inconsistency handling. Um, so say we have two pieces of information from two different sources. One source tells us that two people, John and Mary, are uh, married. The other source tells us that they are single. Okay? And let us assume that the two sources are both very reliable. Okay? Otherwise, what we will do is we discard the information from the least reliable source and, and we're done. So they're both very reliable. But one strategy we can take is say, okay, these sources have expressed something which is correct, but with a limited vocabulary. What they we're trying to say is that John and Mary are in a civil union. Okay? So it's like uh, marriage, but maybe the language that this source uh, used did not uh, have the concept of civil union, and marriage is very close to it, so uh, the source claimed that John and Mary are married, but actually they're in a civil union. Um, similarly, if they're in a civil union, in some sense they are single. Okay, so you can see that both sources in this case would not be entirely wrong. So the strategy for um, dealing with co uh, conflicting information would be to weaken the information by also considering, let's say, borderline cases of, of these uh, settings. So John and Mary are married, we interpret as John and Mary are married or in a civil union. Um, and John and Mary are single, we interpret as John and Mary are single or in a civil union. And if we weaken these two pieces of information this way, obviously if we combine this, we have information which is consistent. Okay. And so in a recent paper together with uh, Oni Prade, we've shown that actually a lot of the current mechanisms for information fusion uh, can be generalized in, in, in this way. Second example is uh, about missing information. Um, so let's take the left example first. Say we know that uh, Manet is an impressionist painter. We know that uh, Monet is an impressionist, an impressionist painter. But we don't know what kind of painter is uh, Renoir. Now one very powerful heuristic uh, is that um, we can so take the, the view that intermediate concepts will have intermediate properties. So it's a form of reasoning, common sense reasoning, which is called interpolation. Well, if, if we, in some way, and I will, will get back to this, find out that the, the, the style of painting of Renoir is somewhat intermediate between Monet and Manet, and using this heuristic of interpolative reasoning, we can derive that Renoir is an impressionist painter. Okay, so this doesn't follow from um, what we know using deduction, but using interpolation, we can derive that this is a plausible conclusion. Example on the right is similar. If you know that some road is unsuitable for cars and for bicycles, and we know that motorbikes are intermediate between cars and bicycles, then using interpolation, we derive that this road is probably not suitable for motorbikes either. Similarly, we can use um, analogies. Um, taking the view that analogical changes in the antecedent of a rule will lead to analogical changes in the consequent of a rule. Um, so um, here we have some information about dogs and cats and um, lynx and wolves and, and coyotes. And we have information that, uh, so this is an uh, analogical proportion, that a cat relates to a lynx in the same way that a dog relates to a coyote. Okay, so we can, um, if you use analogical reasoning, um, from the fact that uh, cats, um, sorry, yeah, cat relates to lynx and cat is domestic and lynx is a predator, 
uh, dog relates to coyote, dog is domestic, so we derive that coyote should also be a predator. Again, this does not follow using uh, deductive reasoning, uh, but if you take the view that analogical changes in the antecedent lead to analogical changes in the conclusion of rules, then we derive that this is um, a plausible rule. Now, in the previous examples, we used, in some sense, similarity information, but only qualitative information. Uh, for, for fusion, we needed borderline cases. Um, for interpolation, we needed information about betweenness. And then in the last case, we needed information about analogical proportions. Now, the view is that this kind of information can, in principle, be learned from data. And um, the, the, um, the, the way to do this, I think, is to first come up with a, a geometric representation of uh, a certain domain. And this is quite popular. Um, su such geometric spaces have been called semantic spaces in computational linguistics. They're known as vector space models and in information retrieval. Um, and then uh, more recently, um, Garden Firsch introduced conceptual spaces in, in, in AI. Um, essentially, especially in the case of conceptual spaces, the idea is that the meaning of a concept is represented as a convex region in some high dimensional space. Okay? And, and so the, the dimensions of, of the space correspond to natural properties of whatever domain we're trying to model. Now, um, the hypotheses in this context are that we can learn such geometric models from the web uh, in such a way that they are sufficiently reliable to be useful in practice. And then that actually, instead of using the geometric models, uh, we can look at which qualitative spatial relations hold in these geometric models and use these qualitative spatial relations as a symbolic representation of the conceptual spaces. Okay. So uh, uh, let me go uh, through this in a bit more detail. Okay. So this is uh, a graph which we obtained from um, using Flickr. Every um, uh, point in, in the graph is a place type. Uh, so using Flickr, using, um, looking at Flickr, which tags people associate to photos which are also tagged with the name of a certain place type, like restaurant, bar, hotel, and so on. We derive a similarity degree. And from these similarities, we use multidimensional scaling to come up with uh, geometric representations. In this case, it's just a two-dimensional representation. In practice, uh, it will make more sense to use higher dimensional representations, maybe five dimensions, 10 dimensions, 20 dimensions. Now here, just two dimensions for um, visual inspection. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see the colors. So some of them are, are red. These are um, places to eat. Uh, so, so manual uh, annotator has labeled these as uh, places to eat. Then there's the yellow ones, which are places to drink. And then um, the black ones are other places. So these include shops, schools, hospitals, and um, other places. Um, now, the first thing to note is that, in fact, we can see that um, natural, let's say, groups of, of, of places, like places to eat, places to drink, indeed tend to correspond to more or less convex regions in this space, even in two dimensions. Um, if you look more closely at, at, at these results, um, so what you see here are the, the red um, uh, um, dots, which appear somewhere else. We can see that most of them make sense. Uh, here, in, in this part of the space, are typically the shops, so they're, they're labeled in black. But we can see uh, th things like candy store, donut shop, cheese shop, which indeed makes sense to, to put there in geometric space, uh, which were labeled by our uh, annotator as being places to eat. Okay, so in fact, maybe the model is, is, is not wrong here. Again, uh, ice cream shop, food truck, sushi restaurant, food court, deli. These are places to eat, but they're more informal places than uh, standard restaurants. Um, so they are indeed intermediate, like bars, and places to drink, they are somewhat intermediate between restaurants, which are found here, and things like shops, which, which are found here. So this seems to um, support the, the, the hypothesis that we can find things like um, betweenness from such a, a data-driven analysis, which would support interpolative reasoning. Um, analogical proportions can also be found. They would correspond to uh, parallelograms in this space. Um, and again, borderline cases, um, so if, 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 let's say, this is the set of all restaurants, borderline cases would literally be the ones which appear uh, close to the border uh, of these regions. Okay. And so similar for, for, for the black dots, so these 
uh, like burger joint, burger joint is in fact a place to eat, so this was mislabeled by our annotator, uh, jazz club, beer garden, lounge, boarding house, um, typically also places where you can um, drink. Okay. So what we have is, again, data on the web, uh, Flickr, and, and more in particular, uh, tags that people associate to photos on Flickr, um, so let's say uh, semi-structured data. Uh, structured data like Freebase and, and other sources can be used to um, come up with incomplete models and com incomplete approximations of conceptual spaces. Um, also, using information extraction from natural language, we can discover information about conceptual spaces. Like in the case of the probabilistic domain theories, I would argue that these are useful, but that they're heuristic, no they're quite noisy, they're inconsistent, and they're context dependent. So again, I would argue for a more qualitative approach where we approximate the conceptual space using qualitative spatial relations. And hopefully in such a way that we obtain a representation which is consistent, robust, and context independent. Now, how we can achieve context independence in this case is by taking the view that changes in contexts would correspond to uh, uh, rescaling some of the dimensions in the space. Okay, some dimensions may not be important in a certain context. And the idea is that if you use qualitative spatial relations, which, are, um, which remain the same under linear transformations, then such change in context would not affect the qualitative representation of the space. So a brief uh, digression on uh, qualitative spatial relations. Um, so RCC8 is a fragment of the uh, region connection calculus, uh, which is often used to, um, in, uh, to explain in a qualitative way how two regions in space are related. So using uh, relations like disconnected, when two regions are disconnected, externally connected when they touch each other but they don't overlap, partially overlapping, equal, and then two types of proper parts, tangential proper parts or proper parts which share a boundary point, non-tangential proper parts or uh, proper parts which don't um, share the boundary point. And you can see that each of these uh, relations remains the same under a linear transformation of the underlying space. So if we approximate the conceptual space using these relations, if you are only interested in these relations, then even if the context changes, um, these re uh, relations should remain um, correct. Now, if you want to reason about conceptual spaces rather than arbitrary spaces, there's a number of differences. The first difference is that we said regions would be convex. Okay, so the theory of conceptual spaces suggests that regions are convex regions. Now, in the paper, uh, together with San Zhang Li last year, uh, we've shown that this does not affect um, consistency procedures for RCC8. Okay, so if you can reason about RCC8 relations, which we can, we can also re reason with RCC8 relations under the assumption that all regions are convex. Now, if you want to reason about conceptual spaces to support, say, interpolative reasoning, we also need to reason about betweenness, and, and this is more tricky. So at the paper at HKI this year, uh, also together with San Zhang Li, we will show that RCC5, which is, uh, let's say, uh, a simpler fragment of the region connection calculus, we can reason with polynomial time about RCC5 relations plus betweenness information. Okay, so, I mean, we haven't solved the full problem yet, but at least it's, it shows that we can, starting from, let's say, a data-driven conceptual space, uh, qualitative abstraction of this conceptual space, and then we can do symbolic reasoning about the resulting uh, representations. Okay. So far, we've seen two things. First, we have uh, probabilistic rules, which we extract from data on the web. Second thing was, uh, let's say, similarity information in the form of conceptual spaces, and then uh, app approximations of these conceptual spaces as qualitative spatial relations. Now, the, the obvious question is, can we put the two together? Because for common sense reasoning, for semantic search, and I would say ultimately also for AGI, we need uh, a certainty and similarity-based reasoning. Now, we have the um, geometric representation of um, data, so the conceptual space approach, which, which are the regions here. So let's say this is region A1, this is region A4, A5, and so on. But in fact, we can also model data in this space. So the dots here uh, can be seen as exemplars, so specific instances of a certain concept. And so these essentially represent the probability distribution. Uh, so we can see in, in this model that most of the instances of A4, so these ones, are also instances of B1. Okay? 
Um, so this is probabilistic information that we can represent. Uh, we can also see that A4 is between A1 and A5. Uh, so this is inter uh, information about betweenness. We can see that A2 is completely between, uh, contained in uh, B2. Okay? So we have, um, let's say, qualitative spatial relations, which model similarity information that we can use for common sense reasoning. And we have probability information, uh, so the distribution of the exemplars in the space. The, the probability information we can convert to a symbolic representation using, um, by representing them as default rules. So we can say that most instances of A4 are instances of A1 rather than this uh, percent. So in, in this way we can go from this data-driven, noisy uh, kind of statistic model that we can derive from data to a symbolic domain theory which is hopefully robust, context-independent uh, and qualitative. And using this view, uh, so uh, we can come up with a logic which um, can do interpolation, interpolative reasoning with uh, default rules. Okay, so uh, here is a, a theory which tells us that undergraduate students are typically adults, PhD students are typically adults, undergraduate students typically don't pay taxes, PhD students typically don't pay taxes, adults typically do pay taxes. Uh, and from this information, if you know that master students are conceptually a bit between undergraduate students and PhD students, we derive that they uh, typically uh, would not pay taxes. Again, this would not uh, be a, a consequence in, in any of the existing systems for non-tonic non reasoning. But we've shown, so in the paper also to be presented at this uh, HKI, that um, we can extend system P uh, for, from non-tonic reasoning with this form of uh, interpolative reasoning. And what we end up with is a logic where the models are qualitative spatial structures describing uh, a structure like this. Okay, so qualitative representations of uh, these kind of structures, which combine similarity information and um, uncertainty. Uh, so the system P is, is monotonic. If, if you add uh, interpolation, it remains monotonic. But we can uh, obtain a non-monotonic uh, approach by saying that we prefer uh, spatial structures, which are in some sense the simplest ones. Okay, so typically, a knowledge base ha will have different models, different, different uh, say, spatial models, which are um, which agree with, with, with the formulas, uh, but some will be simpler than others. By preferring the simpler ones, uh, we, we obtain some form of non monotonic reasoning. And um, so basically, th this concludes the talk. To, to finish, let me come to the question of the, the workshop probability or not. Um, so my view is, is this. Uh, what, what, we what we have is, is information which is out there, data, uh, typically fact-based. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we will need, obviously, probability theory to derive statistical models from this, so probabilistic rule bases, conceptual spaces, and so on. But then when we need to interact with users, we need more symbolic information, so say a semantic wiki, which approximates uh, the uh, statistical models, hopefully in a way which is robust. Users can edit, improve, correct the symbolic knowledge. Symbolic knowledge, knowledge can be used to generate explanations to the users. Okay, and so what we can do with this um, uh, symbolic knowledge using some form of com common sense reasoning is derive plausible arguments. Now, as usual in non monotonic reasoning, we will probably have a lot of different extensions of our theory, so a lot of different arguments, uh, maybe supporting a given claim, and at the same time other arguments uh, arguing against that same claim. So we need a way to break ties, to, to rank arguments, to assess the plausibility of arguments, and this is again where we will need numerical information where we will need probability degrees, similarity degrees, and so on. So we will need probability theory, let's say, in the left part of, of this graph to, to derive models from data and to, to rank arguments. But I think it's not going to be enough. I think we need more symbolic, uh, common sense reasoning to, let's say, provide the interface to users, and also to add maybe similarity-based reasoning um, capabilities to um, existing logics. Okay, thank you. So um, at this point, um, we invite just very technical questions, more conceptual questions we want to save for the panel session at the end. Um, any questions about? Okay. Thank you. Okay.